before. My name is Leona Bintz. I'm a program officer on the protection team, and I work in reviewing applications, offering support to scholars, and being in touch with universities that are seeking to host SAR scholars. Um, and so here's a short overview of the steps of the support that SAR offers to at-risk scholars. And we will talk about each of these steps today. So we will start with an overview of how we evaluate applications from individuals who are seeking assistance from scholars at risk. We will then talk about how we match member universities and SAR scholars to arrange for temporary academic visits at member institutions. We'll also discuss the support that SAR and the host institution can offer to scholars during a placement to support integration, networking, and professional development. Um, and then in the end, we will also talk about how to support a scholar towards the end of their academic visit and in planning for their next steps. Um, and so to begin, um, I will share a little bit more information about our assessment process on the next slide. Wonderful. Um, so of course, the first step um, for scholars at risk is that we get inquiries from individuals who are seeking assistance from scholars at risk. Most of these applications come in directly on our website through a secure online submission form. Um, some other candidates might be referred by SARA network member institutions that might already be in touch with somebody they would like to offer support to, or by other partner organizations, human rights groups, or any other third party institutions. Um, and in the past year, so in our past year, which was from September 2020 to August 2021, we received 1,053 applications, which is about twice as much as we received in the year previously. Um, so that is a large number of applications, partially or largely that increase can be attributed to the developments in Afghanistan. Um, and so since May 2021, we've received 1,430 applications from scholars from Afghanistan seeking assistance. Um, and so at the same time that we've received this very high number of applications, we've also been very heartened to receive a large number of requests from universities in the US, but also in Europe, who are looking to offer support to scholars and to offer temporary academic visits. Um, and so when we review applications from individuals, there are three main things we take into consideration. Whether somebody faces qualifying risk, whether we can um, understand them to be a scholar who would be able to continue their work successfully in our network, and whether they are a fit for the opportunities and support that SAR offers. Um, so when we look at risk, you can see on the right, we have a list of the application materials. So determine whether somebody faces qualifying risk, we ask each individual for a risk statement, any supporting documents, and some kind of countries that might be legal documents or media articles. Um, but of course, threats can be discrete. So this can also be a risk reference to help us understand whether somebody faces risk that qualifies for support from scholars at risk. Um, and generally speaking, that can be risk of wrongful arrest, wrongful imprisonment, violence, um, general conflict situations, um, or other barriers to somebody being able to safely continue their work and research. Um, when we look at scholarship, we ask each applicant for a CV and a list of publications and courses they have taught, as well as for academic references to get a sense of what their work is about and um, where they have been able to publish um, and where there could be a fit in the network. We do a few um, initial checks, such as whether there might be any obvious examples of plagiarism to make sure that somebody uh, would be able to have a successful academic visit. Um, and the third question for us is whether somebody is a fit for the opportunities in the network. Um, so we ask a few questions um, about criminal convictions, any affiliations, um, anything that might raise concerns later on. Um, and 
based on the opportunities that we usually see in our network, we make determinations on whether it is likely that we would be able to offer assistance to a scholar. Um, and once we accept a scholar for assistance from the Scholars at Risk Network, um, we create an anonymous profile and packet to then match them with a member institution. Um, so let's go to the second slide. Yes, thank you. Um, on identifying scholars, and host universities. Um, so a big part of what we do at Scholars at Risk is of course to match scholars with universities. Um, and so when a university is interested in hosting a SAR scholar, whether or not they have funding, and funding is something that we will speak to um, later on, we recommend contacting staff at Scholars at Risk to express interest in hosting a scholar so that we can then uh, talk through the criteria um, and ensure that we can create a good fit between a member institution and an at-risk scholar. Um, so questions that we encourage hosts to think about when thinking about inviting a scholar is why uh, you are interested in hosting a scholar and um, is it to, for example, engage more in teaching, in research, in lectures? Is it because of interest in a specific geographic area or a specific topic? Um, what are the motivations on a university's end? Um, what discipline and field um, are you looking to host a scholar in? Um, and also in which, for example, department, faculty, would there be an academic mentor that would be able to supervise and offer support to a scholar. Um, other questions are what language skills are needed for a successful visit. Um, and especially should there be teaching um, engagements. Um, the other question, of course, is many scholars are seeking to travel with their families. Um, and so to make sure that we can offer good fits, um, it's helpful to know beforehand whether um, the support, whether there will be available support to support a scholar traveling alone or with a partner or also with their children. Um, and so when thinking about these questions, one thing that we encourage host universities to do is to create a committee at their university um, so that there are several university contacts at the university thinking about where the best uh, fit for a scholar could be, but also how to connect them to resources later on. Um, and since this process can take some time, and we usually um, nominate several scholars, we suggest reaching out to scholars at risk about six months before the ideal start date. Um, and let's go to the next slide. Exactly. Um, so on nominations, interviews, and offers. Um, so as I said, um, when a university would like to host a scholar, we share nominations with the university. Um, whenever we accept a scholar, we first create an, an anonymous packet so that we can share information widely with universities without revealing any identity or sensitive information. Um, so if a university requests nominations, we usually put forward several candidates. That means that a university receives several candidates for consideration, but also that the scholar is put forward oftentimes to several universities. That is to make sure that a university can find a good fit, but also given the urgent situation that many people we work with, that's also to make sure that we can find an opportunity for them as soon as possible. Um, but throughout that process, we make sure to let universities know if a scholar is under consideration for several opportunities, if there has been any development, um, and of course, to also let scholars know. Um, once a so if after reviewing the initial anonymous profiles, there is a scholar or two who seem to be of particular interest, we can then share a packet that then includes the full materials that we received in the application. So a CV, academic letters of reference, work samples, and the risk statement, um, so that the university has a better idea of the academic background. Um, and then if a candidate is of interest, the next step would be 
the next step that we highly encourage would be to arrange for an interview. Um, I should say that interviews might not be possible in all situations. Um, so for example, for people who are in Afghanistan right now or who are in Yemen, um, it might be challenging or impossible to arrange for an interview because of internet connection or because of security concerns. Um, and the same, of course, goes for somebody who might be in a situation where they might face surveillance and where having an interview might put them at heightened risk. But generally, we do highly encourage an interview so that the university and the scholar can meet, can ask questions, and can have a better sense of whether they are fit for each other. Because one thing that we stress um, is that the better an academic fit is, um, the better also the transition opportunities for a scholar are afterwards. Um, and so for the interview, we encourage to focus on academics, to not ask questions about risk, um, and to invite scholars to share any questions um, so that a scholar can also make a good and informed decision when having an offer. Um, if a university would like to make an offer, um, at this stage, this whole process still goes through SAR. Um, so until an offer is made, SAR is the intermediary between a scholar and the university. So we ask that this offer letter is first shared with us with basic details on the salary, the job responsibilities. So for example, whether it's research, teaching, any other responsibilities, who their supervisor will be, the start date, and any benefits. Um, so that we can then present the offer to a scholar. Um, and once the scholar accepts the offer and signs, then we will connect the scholar with the university. Um, and I will hand over to Rose now um, for the next steps in preparing for arrival. Uh, thanks so much, Leona, for walking us through the steps involved in the assessment, matching, and offer stage. Uh, so I was introduced before, but I'm Rose Anderson, Director of Protection Services, and I just want to say I'm so grateful to see so many of you here with us today, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Feel free to put any in the chat, um, and we'll also have a question and answer period in just a few moments. Um, so I'll be walking through steps involved in arrival, helping make a placement as um, supportive as possible for a scholar, and also sharing a quick outline of who's responsible for what between SAR and host institutions. Um, so I'm preparing for arrival. So Leona mentioned academic mentors already, and we really do encourage thinking about this in the matchmaking stage, but certainly before arrival, we recommend that there is an academic mentor designated for a scholar who will be in regular touch with the scholar to lend academic and professional support during the visit. Especially in the early weeks of a visit, an academic mentor is essential to helping a scholar understand the norms and expectations of the host department and to make connections within the department, introductions to colleagues, and perhaps even help them make connections at nearby academic institutions, and really to be a touchstone for the scholar as they navigate the academic side of their placement. Having a separate administrative liaison is also key. So this is someone who can help answer questions around payroll, health insurance, library access, or other questions that are more on the human resources side of things that are incredibly vital when someone has landed in a new place and is trying to navigate new systems. So we recommend indicating clearly to the incoming scholar who to go to for what to avoid confusion. Housing is obviously a key arrival preparation step. Some institutions are able to offer housing as part of their package of support, but if that's not possible, your institution's guidance may be through the International Student and Scholar Office to an arriving scholar on where to look for housing close to campus is key. Um, proximity to campus is really key 
or public transit for our universities and colleges that might be in the US and outside major metropolitan areas. Um, we just want to note, this is likely obvious, but scholars may not be coming in with their own means of transport. So thinking about um, where they can live and also easily get to campus is key. A note that we as SAR cannot arrange longer term housing for scholars, but we can arrange for temporary housing. So we can help put a scholar and their family up in a hotel, for example, as they do a housing search on their own or with your uh, institution support. Uh, Leona touched on dependent needs already, um, but this is the case for many scholars, but not all. They may be traveling with dependents and in particular children that will factor into housing needs, the salary that's available, uh, appropriate for a family of that size, and they may need additional advice around schooling options or maybe even language training. Um, what's important to think about is if there's anything already offered by your institution that could then be made available to the scholar. So if there's a discounted childcare program, for example, just to kind of survey those types of resources ahead of time and think about what can be made available to the visiting scholar as well. In terms of other upfront needs that are part of the arrival stage, if your institution is able to cover costs for visas and flights, that is welcome. But if not, you're encouraged to reach out to SAR because we have emergency funding that can be called on to cover these costs. We do have some donor stipulations about what vendors can be used. So we prefer to direct these, sorry, we prefer to pay for these directly versus do reimbursements. But if you are in need of support for this cost, please do reach out. We don't want something like the cost of a visa fee or a flight ticket to stand in the way of a scholar arriving to campus. Once the logistics are set, it's time to start thinking about the actual day and days after arrival and helping a scholar feel welcome. If it's possible for someone from your institution to meet the scholar at the airport, that's welcome. It's not necessary, but other assistance in terms of a hired car, information on a shuttle would be really helpful um, because chances are they have, they have never been to this location before and would welcome information on how to get from point A to point B. Um, if someone is available to meet them at their accommodation to hand over keys, um, show them around, even have a small dinner with them in the first few days, these are all things that we've heard from scholars over the years are incredibly helpful as means to help them feel welcome and start to acclimate to their new environment. Um, if there's a small welcome event, even over Zoom, given our small, um, given our current realities, that could be welcome as well. Really just thinking about opportunities for scholars to meet their new colleagues and start to learn who is who. Um, so I know that we have a couple of experienced hosts here with us. And so if anyone feels comfortable dropping into the chat, any types of welcome events they've done for scholars, feel free. It might spark ideas for some of our new or prospective hosts. Um, but as, as eager as everyone is to welcome a scholar to campus, we just encourage you to keep in mind that scholars may also need a bit of rest and time to settle in after what might have been a difficult journey. Um, perplexed with bureaucratic challenges, if that's visa related, COVID related or beyond. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. Uh, it's important to welcome, but also give a bit of space for them to settle in before they're expected to start taking up their teaching or research duties on campus. I'll make a quick note on security. So some scholars, once they're outside their home country, are comfortable speaking publicly and being known on campus as an at-risk individual, but many are not. And so we recommend and request that before planning an announcement of a scholar's arrival in a newsletter, on social media, before featuring them on your department's webpage, make sure to ask first what type of publicity the scholar is comfortable with and 
how they wish to be introduced around campus, whether online or person to person. Um, some may not want to be listed in your institution's directory, while others may be very open to publicity and want, in fact, to take on as many speaking opportunities as they can. But the most important thing to do is for you to ask the scholar first before making any plans. We can go to the next slide. Support during a placement. So once a placement is started, we have a few quick tips to help the visit be as successful as possible. So the first is sort of an expansion of the orientation point. It's really essential that scholars are clear on how to use their benefits and access the resources that are available to them, including health services, health insurance and counseling and services that might be available on campus public safety as well ensuring that they know who to call in case of an emergency a note on counseling scholars may be coming from traumatic backgrounds and regardless adjusting to a new environment and the disruption to their career for some which may have involved a loss of identity they may be dealing with a number of challenges and stressors. We at SAR encourage scholars to take advantage of any resources for emotional well being that might exist on campus. And so, likewise, we encourage all hosts to make sure scholars are aware of how to access this support. Um, if that's an EAP program, if your university has that, or a counseling center, um, we encourage you to make sure the scholar is aware of that right from the beginning. If, these type, if this type of support doesn't exist on your campus or isn't adequate, SAR can also make referrals or offer financial support if a scholar chooses to seek counseling. To shift a little bit to the academics and going back to the role of that academic mentor. This is a role that's really key to helping a scholar make academic connections that will not just um, support their, their time on campus, but also help set them up for their future career plans as well. One part of this is flagging opportunities to scholars that they might otherwise miss, like conferences, calls for proposal, or other publishing opportunities. We have a note here on uh, things to avoid. And here we specifically mean helping scholars avoid predatory journals and conferences. We know that these abound, unfortunately, and they blanketly target wide swaths of academics around the globe, but we have found that some scholars might be unfamiliar with what constitutes a red flag. So we encourage hosts to help direct scholars to journals and conferences that will help their careers in the long term. And I'll just note, you know, especially with the emphasis on the importance of the academic mentor, more than one academic mentor can be helpful for some scholars, in particular those that are interdisciplinary and can benefit from multiple um, academic support persons. Uh, and some scholars might be coming into your institution to teach that might be part of the arrangement, but for others and uh, for scholars who are comfortable doing so, guest lecturing can be a great way for a scholar to get experience in the classroom if they aren't already doing this teaching. And it also expands the circle of those on campus who have the benefit of learning from a scholar's unique expertise. Uh, if anyone has had a scholar guest lecture, I invite you to share your experience with that, um, whether that's been through something you arranged on campus or through the SAR speaker series, which is another opportunity for uh, scholars to have speaking engagements. And if you have questions about that, feel free to reach out. I'll go to the next slide now, which is just breaking out some of the roles um, between SAR and a host institution. So we have some experienced hosts on the call, so you may already be familiar with this, but for those that are newer, uh, I just want to provide a quick overview of what SAR does and what we ask hosts to do. Um, to highlight a few of the roles that are under SAR, so we, SAR, the protection team, um, Miona and, and her colleagues, 
Um, we meet regularly with scholars as they settle into a position and throughout a placement. So we're in touch with scholars before they arrive on your campus, during the visit to see how it's going. We also work with them on planning their next steps. Um, and that transition question and what happens at the end of a placement is something that will be uh, dived into a bit more in the breakout session. Um, I've mentioned our funding before that can be used for things like flights, visa fees, also urgent costs that may come up during a placement. Um, hosts can request this. The requests typically come from scholars, but we want to make sure that hosts are aware of this means of support as well. Beyond urgent costs, we can also support things that help the scholars uh, professional development. So that might be a skills based class, a language class. It could be perhaps um, they have work accepted at a conference and are seeking support to travel to that conference. That is support we can provide as well. So we alert scholars to this, but we want to make sure hosts are aware as well. So if you see an opportunity for it, um, don't hesitate to reach out to SAR. Um, and I, I won't go through every bullet here in light of time, but I do want to just note that SAR supports scholars for multiple years, but in order to offer support to scholars who are currently in their countries facing urgent threat, we do have to end support to scholars after a period of time. The duration of support differs for every case and things that factor into this are the number of years a scholar has been supported, if they've had success identifying other employment options, legal status, and other considerations. So this is something that SAR communicates with scholars directly uh, in terms of our support relationship. And this is a process known as graduation. In many situations, it's a recognition of a scholar's self-sufficiency in employment after time. In terms of the roles of hosts, I'll highlight just a few here. I think, and I should also note the, the immense uh, contributions that hosts make cannot be captured on one slide. So this does not mean to uh, this is not meant to encompass all that hosts do, but I just want to point out a few of the basics um, for those that might be newer to this um, to this project. So visa sponsorship is something that's the host's responsibility. Um, your institution is the scholar's employer and visa sponsor. We can advise and offer funding, but we don't sponsor nor apply for visas as scholars at risk. We ask that hosts take the lead on arrival logistics, flights, accommodation, but as I've mentioned before, we are here if our funding support is needed um, or if we can help arrange temporary accommodation. The academic support during the placement is something that we rely on host institutions for since an academic mentor is the best place to provide discipline specific guidance and support, especially when it comes to making connections and taking advantage of opportunities on campus and beyond within their discipline. And we ask that you meet regularly with the hosted scholar and stay in touch with us if there's anything we should know. We also meet with scholars regularly, as I've mentioned, and we do mid visit and end of visits evaluation evaluations with scholars and hosts. And that it's basically a two page form where we ask questions to see how the placement's going and to help uh, invite suggestions of further support that might be needed. Um, but beyond this formal um, means of gathering information from from a host and a scholar we invite you to be in touch at any time. We seek to work in partnership with hosts and scholars throughout a placement. And so just the more regular communication we can have with hosts, um, the, the better. So I think that is the end of the, the slides. Um, but I wanna mention that all of the content that we've covered here and much more can be found on our how to host guide. We also have a hosting checklist, which we can drop in the chat 
and we'll also send afterwards. Um, I'll mention that all of our guidance in, you know, in this presentation, in this guide, is based on SAR's experience working with scholars and hosts throughout the years and are a reflection of common, commonly expressed themes and needs. However, each scholar's needs are unique to the individual. And while this is our perspective, an even more relevant perspective on this question of how scholars can best be supported during a placement um, would be that of a scholar who's been hosted through this R program. So I'm very uh, happy that towards the end of this workshop at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we'll have a contribution from a SAR supported scholar in the United States. So please do stay with us, come back after the breakout group, because we're all very eager to hear the scholar's valuable contribution. For now, I will turn it over to Anne to share a few thoughts on uh, unlocking funds at your institution, uh, speaking from her experience as an administrator. Sure, thank you. I'm going to cheat, if I may, since I have the uh, uh, the mic right now, and I just want to follow up on what Rose said, the, in the sense that the staff at Salt Scholars at Risk do this extremely rigorous review of candidates, and I think that's one of the reasons, besides the mission, that so many of us feel comfortable working with Scholars at Risk to seek to host scholars. We know that all the preparatory work that we might wonder about has actually been done. And it gives them also immense credibility uh, with our own government officials, which is sometimes extremely helpful, as you can imagine. Um, also, one other comment. All of what Rose has said sounds like a lot, may sound like a lot, and it, and it is. But every institution can bite off what it's capable of biting off at first time. For example, when you start looking at the lists, um, I know that uh, I've tend, I, the positions that I've had have been at universities that don't tend to have uh, major endowments, uh, that don't tend to be in a position to allow somebody to be a research scholar for a year, et cetera. Well, that means that you look at somebody who is more ready to contribute in teaching with certain adjustments, perhaps. But um, if you your visa office may, may not be, your international office uh, may need a little bit of time to come up to speed depending on how big your university is. Well, maybe you start with somebody who's already displaced and in country. There are many different ways to contribute and the, the uh, staff really help you hone in on areas. The last thing I would say is that the um, thinking about the academic fit is utterly key to success. And once you're looking at risk assessments and statements, it's very easy to be overwhelmed by the sense of uh, the urgency that all these scholars have. Um, but you can't contribute in ways that aren't appropriate for your institution. Someone you can't uh, assist will be great at another institution. So you have to have a certain amount of discipline as you're looking for this. And then the other thing along with that is that you know, Scholars at Risk is a wonderful way to bring on colleagues in areas that you're looking at. You know, these are great scholars. And um, maybe your institution hasn't yet started a lot of work in a particular area. And then, you know, you're bringing in this incredible expert who can help you do things that you've never been able to do. So it really is uh, one of the beauties of it is this reciprocity uh, that occurs through the placements. Okay. So onto money, right? We can't do anything without the funds to support scholars. I don't have a hundred tricks up my sleeves, but I do have just a few things to think about. And if you already know about these, please indulge me just for a few minutes, not even five, in saying uh, the major things that you might want to look at. So some of you do have your own money, so to speak, and you can bring experts in for a semester or a year, but many people don't. And if you're not in an administrative position, you need to go to somebody and make a case to bring in a person. Having somebody making the case for the principle that we're universities and universities should engage in this effort, that it's part of our prof professional ethos as university people is a great thing to do. But even then the administrator may say, okay, that's great, but where's the money coming from? Well, first of all, every university has what, they're different. There's languages that may differ university to university, but it's most frequently called temporarily unallocated salary funds. 
So since we hire yearly people, since we are on a yearly hiring cycle for faculty, right? The administration always has funds for where people have resigned or retired and they haven't yet put people in those positions. Um, and so, and most searches, you know, complete during a year, but there are always some that don't quite, that don't finish. And all of this puts um, change, so to speak, money in the, in the purse strings of administrators. And you should make a, you should make a case for it. You should say, you know, there, there's temporarily unallocated money. And I, I think that this would be a good way to use it. Believe me, all universities have plans on how to use it, but that's where some of that cash is. If you're planning on bringing somebody in, in an area of enrollment need, and you believe this person can teach either a full or a partial schedule, that person is already earning their keep right through the teaching. And so the normal salary budget, especially for temporary positions can, um, is, is a fair uh, target, so to speak. For those of you who have endowed positions, and you know, a lot of times when you're looking for a senior scholar, that, that search may take two years to fill, right? Or even three years. If the person has a specialty that's relevant for the caveats of the endowed position, use those funds on a temporary um, basis. There are many, the scholars who are at risk span all fields of an academic endeavors, right? And so when they are scientists, it's not infrequent that that person could be brought in under the, could be paid under um, some kind of grant. Now, of course, that depends on the government restrictions for different areas and the use of funds, but certainly um, research scientists, postdocs uh, for early career people, um, it can often help be part of the kitty. We have the ability to work interinstitutionally. Now, having two placements in the same town sounds easier than it often is, but it's definitely worth thinking about. If you're many, you know, many of our cities have almost academic neighborhoods where we have institutions that sit side by side or close to side by side. What if you could contribute half a position and the other university contributes another half? Or there's some other kind of uh, institution that could contribute. Um, we have many universities have executive resident in residence programs, artists in residence programs. Um, these are all ways that you can um, bring to bear other, other types of funding mechanisms. And of course, they're donors. Now, it's challenging to get the right to appeal to a donor who's already in the system, so to speak because the university has already slotted them for particular types of gifts. But it's fair to talk with a development officer to see, do you have somebody, do we have a donor who perhaps came to the United States in a difficult situation whom you think would be willing to contribute? Or do you have a donor who just cares a lot about the mission that way? Um, we were able to find one to contribute for one year of funding that way. So you do have to scrounge around, so to speak, and look for funding. but. There are funding sources. You may also have local foundations that would be interested, et cetera. So I would really encourage you to think uh, creatively and to talk with colleagues, to talk with those of us who are on the steering committee and partners um, around the country and across the globe to see how you can put together some of these means to uh, bring in a scholar. It's, uh, and I'd be happy to personally take calls or emails. It often, happens that a brainstorming session will suddenly pop open an idea that may not have occurred to you before. So thank you.